Hey everyone, welcome to our Ethics on Next Gen AI keynote fireside chat. Our guest is a member of the executive committee and head of blockchain data and digital assets at the World Economic Forum. She also leads the Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and she's a licensed attorney in two states. Please welcome Sheila Warren. Thanks, Shilpi. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's long time coming, Sheila. And Sheila is also an advisor for Data Ethics for All. So I'm so excited to have you, Sheila. Oh, me too. Thanks so much, Shilpi. <laughs> so let's get right into it. According to Bo Young Lee, Uber's chief diversity and inclusion officer, diversity and inclusion needs to be something that every single employee at the company has a stake in. So how, according to you, can we use data and artificial intelligence-based technology to drive inclusion? It's such a great question. And I want to I wanna kind of set some context here. Part of the problem, I think, that a lot of companies have when it comes to diversity data is the small numbers problem. And I think many of us are familiar with, with this. It's the idea that the amount of data that you have on a particular demographic community is so small that it seems difficult to do any predictive analytics or any sort of real in-depth analysis, frankly, of uh, to spot problems, let alone create solutions. So what happens a lot of times is rather than looking at specific demographic groups, um, black women, LGBTQ, people of color, you know, whatever it might be, uh, companies tend to aggregate that data into bigger groups. They look at women as a category or they look at LGBTQ as a category. And what happens then is that you actually eliminate the ability to distinguish that certain groups are uh, having a different experience in the company than others. So part of what an algorithm can do is help you address some of this stuff, is to say, we don't have to succumb to the small numbers problem or small numbers thinking, as I like to think about it. We yeah. don't have to use that as an excuse to some extent. Sure. Part of what I've seen in companies that I've worked in, and I won't name specifics, um, is that uh, you might have gender parity, let's say, within a level. So let's say you have a company with like, you know, 10 levels or whatever. So within level two, you actually have pay equity when it comes to gender and you can run analytics on that. And that's very straightforward. You can even go out and get certifications from external bodies. There's a lot of companies that do this now that will certify that you meet pay equity standards. However, what's being missed is promotion opportunities. So maybe, right, the women in this example, hypothetical, are getting paid uh, appropriately for the level, but really they ought to be at the next level. And they're not getting promoted, right? They're not getting mentored or included in that promotion path, which is not reflected in some of the more black and white analytical frameworks that are routinely applied, I think, to company data. So what you're trying to say is if we use better artificial intelligence system, then we can actually recognize uh, a deeper level of patterns where, you know, exactly. people who are there for a longer time, especially women and who are due for promotion, uh, but for whatever reason, they have not, they've been ignored or not promoted, then we can start looking at those on a more granular level. Exactly. And you can transfer over time. Because what these certifications, for example, is they're looking at a snapshot. They're looking at the time that's come in. Maybe they look historically, have a look back of maybe maximum, let's say, a year. But over time, if you can track, you can actually trend spot. So if a certain sub sub demographic of people of individuals are leaving the company and you know over time, you may not notice it because it really looks like a oh, one 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 That's here and there, right? Or they're in different divisions, different offices, whatever. It's right. very very. It's almost impossible for any human to spot that kind of pattern. But an AI, an algorithm could do that and could say, hey, over the last five years, we've noticed that a lot of this particular sub demographic are leaving and particularly leaving from your, you know, Asian offices or from your North American offices. And that signal can provide the first indicator that there could be a problem. I agree. And this, uh, a lot of AI systems now uh, allow for continuous loop mechanism rather than once a year, you know, review process and evaluation process. And and it's more of a 360 degree review. So before the uh, unhappy or unengaged employee has to be a whistleblower or leaves the company, there are ways we could, if we could recognize the patterns and do something more to either engage them. And sometimes it's not even linear, right? You can't always say that if the person is, is, has been in the company for 
X number of years, then they have to be promoted. Sometimes people perform better. It has to be performance based, not just on the number of uh, time or duration that you are with the company. Right? I also think you can track things, right? To say who is their manager. Because a lot of times performance is linked to the team that you're on. You might thrive under one kind of manager and not another. Some of that can be cultural. It's very, very hard to spot. And so it may be that you have a really, really high performer who joins a new team and suddenly performance drops. And if that happens all the time, if you notice that a certain kind of person, let's say a woman, moves under a certain kind of person, maybe another woman, for who knows, and yeah. all of a sudden performance drops, you can spot that over time. Whereas other people on that team might perform extremely well. They might actually thrive under such a person. And it may be their performance actually is enhanced under such a manager, but another category may not do as well. And you just, that's not something you're going to pick up. True, true. No, oh, very true. And another question, because you, you brought women up and because we both are women and, and, and in this, you know, empower, we want to empower more women and influence the work culture. How pervasive do you think unconscious bias is and how does it impact women in the workplace? So I, I think it's universal. I think that every single person, myself included, you know, brings to bear a slate of experiences, a slate of expectations and assumptions that we are that are unconscious to us, that we're not aware of, uh, that that bias us. It's just a fact. And I think what we see reflected in society and who is kind of uh, empowered, uh, it, it becomes the dominant modality. So the, the reality is that leadership, you know, particularly in tech companies, is largely men. It's largely white men. Uh, and therefore, there is an overemphasis on their characteristics and traits and the biases that they hold. Um, it would look very different if we, and, that, and that's what I think we have to address most critically, right? Because they're the people that are in these positions of power. But if it were to shift and you were to suddenly have women of color in positions of power, we would bring our own set of biases. Those are just not the ones we need to be talking about as a society because they're not relevant because that's not the world that we live in, right? But it's not to say that that is not the case. So I try to be very conscious about, you know, for me, for example, um, I think that Americans have a bias towards other Americans. I think that many people in my generation were raised with uh, this notion of American exceptionalism. It's something that we're not, we don't talk about, we're not conscious of, but you see a lot of this replicated through hiring practices. Right? You just see it happen. Many Americans are much less culturally exposed than I've had the privilege to be. I'm kind of a, a you know, a, a dual uh, person. Like I grew up, I spent a lot of time in India. My parents are immigrants. My husband's an immigrant. So I'm very exposed to uh, that thing. And I work at a very international organization. That is a very unusual thing. Very unusual. So many Americans, you know, don't necessarily work outside of the country as much. They haven't been educated outside the country. So there is this bias that comes into play culturally that I think is something that's given less attention but is quite pervasive. As an example. I agree with you 100% because if you look at it like culturally uh, and even languages that you know most Americans speak they are like sing they, they speak single language they're not dual multilingual or even trilingual right like I like others like I, I can speak four languages right yeah. so the more languages I think we can speak read and write the more we are aware of and accepting of different cultures uh, and ethnicities and backgrounds and we work well with more with people yeah so i think that's something we should ad address uh, i know schools they do offer languages but um, the, it, what what can we do to increase this exposure to culture and ethnicity according to you yeah you know, again, I feel lucky because my kids are growing up bicultural. Uh, I did marry uh, an immigrant, uh, and so I do feel that this is uh, this is a huge benefit to my children. What I were I got language education in school, so I can speak Spanish. You know, but I wasn't educated around the culture, and it's different. So I may have the ability. I think that trains your brain. There's all the study about how you speaking multiple languages wires your brain differently. You can think more creatively. You know, that's all that's all well and good. But yeah. it's cultural aspects and components, right? So I deeply value Indian culture. I deeply value, in my particular case, Mexican culture yes. uh, for a variety of reasons, right? I live in a very uh, Latinx neighborhood. It's a very Mexican neighborhood. So I think there are things like that. And honestly, it's something that we talk about a lot. We live in a very diverse neighborhood on purpose. Uh, and we live in a, a Latinx neighborhood that doesn't reflect our cultural heritage on purpose. We want my kids exposed to a different culture that isn't inherently familiar to them and to understand what it feels like to kind of be in an environment where you're, you're um, differently not the dominant culture, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
I honestly think it has to start at the top. I think we're in a climate right now, and this is global. This is not just in the United States, although I think we're an exemplar of this kind of behavior, um, where we are seeing this kind of, you know, xenophobia. I, I just want to call it out for what it is. You know, we're seeing a tremendous backlash against immigrants all over Europe. Uh, we're seeing this happen even in Australia. You know, we're seeing it certainly in the United States from the administration. Yeah. And so part of what we're fighting, and I hate to be a pessimist here or cynical about this or depressing, but part of what we're fighting is a cultural tide that is kind of saying, you know, uh, one experience is more valuable than another. More outsider. So, yeah. yeah. So what I tell my friends, you know, what I really push for in my child's school is exposure, 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 exposure. We watch programming in different languages that I don't even understand. We watch a Chinese language cartoon. Yeah. I, don't know, I have no idea, but oh. we just watch it to kind of understand, you know, what are, what are the cultural With nuances? The subtitles. Yeah, exactly. Subtitles. We just try to kind of understand because it's not just the language because they can, well, one of my kids can read, the other two are too little, but she oh. can read the subtitles, but she's getting subtly cultural influence from the way that that cartoon is done, you know, that I'm not, I don't even aware of, but it's getting, it's, it's imbuing her consciousness. That's sort of a pathetic way using this sort of, no, I think thing, it's but it's better bad. than, you know, it's better than it, it we're trying. <laughs> all you we can do is pathetic at all. I think it's brilliant. And, and if you look like historically, that's how like a child is born in any family. They don't know, they're not born with any language or culture. It's, what the environment is, what their parents speak, like to that extent, even my, my dog, right? I mean, it, he's bilingual, like we talk to him in two languages and he understands. So yeah. like, you know, whatever they are brought up and trained and taught uh, and they listen to a lot to your point, like if children are exposed to languages, even if we don't speak them, we don't understand them, they will pick them up. Yeah. So, the other thing I think that really helps a lot, and I didn't grow up with this kind of access, uh, is, is books. So children's books now, there's a tremendous amount of diverse children's literature. And yeah. so our bookshelves are just peppered with different colors, different experiences, different, you know, clothing, different traditions, all of this. And there's a tremendous amount of resource around there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's the quickest Google for birthday presents. I'm, I'm like that auntie, you know, who brings all of these diverse books. And I'm like, these are always our presents, yeah. but they're not just Indian. You know, there, there are all kinds of different cultures that I, we found compelling because the stories are universal. The things that children struggle with around the world are largely universal, but just having that background where you know what they're walking through is just a different landscape it's a different form of housing it's a different attire like all of that i think has a very profound impact on a child in just normalizing that there are many many different ways to walk through the world and i, I my hope is that if more people do that uh that we will then have a world in which that kind of difference is celebrated not othered but we have a long way to go <laughs> Yeah, that, that is very true. And uh, you talked about Mexican culture and Asian culture. And I know both of those cultures uh, because I'm an Asian and I understand that because we, we value like large family concept and we, we value being together as opposed to like these solo families, right? Which America, yeah. American culture uh, promotes or celebrates like we celebrate the group culture of families and bringing people together and all of that so just that itself is such a different mindset like when we were in India we would hear that in America when you are as soon as you're 16 17 18 whatever that may be when you're an adult parents say that okay now you're on your own you have to earn your own thing and you have to move out of the house like if you live in the house with your parents as an adult that's considered to be like you're not successful mm -hmm. and and you know so it's like a completely different way of thinking yeah. whereas in in our culture it's like you you stay with your parents for as long as as possible you basically first they take care of you and then you start taking care of them yes right? so it, it's very different, it's really more different. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if we had to create a framework to measure inclusion in the workplace, what would that look like? This is the, I think, you know, $10 million question. And, and I think we've seen, certainly in light of recent events in the US, we've seen new approaches coming here. So first of all, I just, I, I wanna talk about the transition from 
uh, diversity as a concept to this kind of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Uh, I love that frame. I think that it really is far more about diversity. And I wrote a piece for Wired that where I said diversity is not a, it's not a numbers game. Uh, right. You can bring people in the door and that's solving one problem. That's solving an optical problem. It's not solving a cognitive diversity problem. It's not solving an inclusion problem. And it certainly is not solving a retention problem. If you're not keeping people, then who can, and what are you doing? You know, it's almost setting them up for failure. So how do we set people up for success when they're entering environments that, let's be honest, the reason you're paying attention to this as a company is because you're not doing a good job right, at it, so you're worried about it. So you're, you're de facto bringing people into an environment where they are, not, uh, they are going to be othered by default. Uh, and so you have to provide, I think, a lot of training. Uh, you have to think about mentoring models, and you have to think about how are you accommodating some of that cultural difference. Uh, or, or even if it's not culture, whatever the difference might be. Mm -hmm. Part of what I, I found um, positive about this pandemic time, and there's a lot of negative, obviously, yes. part of what's positive is just the ability we have to have a window into people's home lives. Yes. So, you know, so and my children, on my, on my kids exactly, here, you know, my treat, you know, people, my kids are running in and out all the time of different conversations, you know, yeah. I've kind of gotten to understand on a more intimate way some of the challenges that people on my team face, my peers and other colleagues face. Oh. And I've tried to be a very honest uh, interpreter of some of that, like really trying to call out the challenges of being a working parent during this time, you know, some of those things. Um, and I think that we need more people in positions of leadership. Obviously, we need models. We need role models of uh, working mothers, of women of color, LGBTQ, whatever it might be, neurodiverse people. We need all these different, uh, different able people models, you know, at senior levels. It's not enough to kind of start the pipeline at the junior level and bring people up. You really have to kind of bring people in at the top. Now, what happens a lot of times, and we know this through the data, is that you create a chief diversity and inclusion officer, and that person is a woman of color, da da da, like every time, right? Yes. They are the one executive team member who's a person of color, let alone a woman of color. They're often the only woman. And yeah. then they're like tasked with this impossible Herculean task of like changing the demographic of the entire company. It's ridiculous. It, it basically can't be done. That's not the answer. It's about really saying it's important to have talent that is in the business line, right? Also in the business line and is an integral part of the company and the company's success. Super critical, oh, cool. right? So how do you find these people? You look, you know, there's this um, funny, I'll, I'll tell the story, but there's this really funny, um, I have a good friend and so, uh, he hired, you know, this, he has a very diverse team. His company, he has the most diverse team in his company. And to him, he just built a team. He came in, a senior person, he built a team. It was like not a big thing. He just built a team and the people that he, the best candidates were, you know, a lot of very, very diverse team. Hmm. And the leadership came to him and said, you now need to train everyone on how to build a diverse team. He was like, what are you talking about? You're just, okay. So we were talking about this. And I said, I, I kind of laughingly said, I think you should just have three slides. And the first slide has the word just. The second slide has the word hire, and the third slide has the word them. And you just flip through that and say, here is the answer, right? Like on some level, you just hire them. Like, it, it, and I don't mean to be simplistic, but oh. there's all these barriers created to this process when at the end of the day, it's about prioritization and saying, we understand that our company is not going to succeed if we are not reflecting the demographic diversity of our customer base and of the world around us. True, and, and these days, there's a lot of talk of, you know, diversity and inclusion in corporate, Amer like not America, but globally, but then it's like, just like you said, right, it's like this chief, it's like this checkbox where the top chief uh, diversity and inclusion officer is, is a woman or a woman of color, and I, they feel like, okay, we have done our part, it's a checkbox, yeah. and now we have done our part to, towards making the right step or looking from the outside, it looks like we are doing the right thing for diversity and inclusion. And that's where it ends. Or they are tasked with this uh, phenomenal task of now changing the entire, shifting the entire culture exactly. of the company and making it more diverse all, all overnight, right? How, how can that happen if you're not hiring the right people from all, all levels and expertise? Exactly. You know, the other thing that happens a lot is I think people use other offices. So they'll say, oh, okay, so my office in San Francisco is this demographic. Okay, but now I'm going to open up an office in Europe and hire only Europeans, you know? <laughs> and, you know what I mean? So then you have an office dynamic that is very culturally appropriate to that office, 
but oh. then you're not connect. There's always this distinction and the HQ culture, the dominant kind of culture becomes a really interesting challenge for anyone in those other offices to kind of engage with. Yeah. And then, right. So, so it's, it's, it helps in a sense because you're saying, oh, okay. So in this country, in Europe, we're going to be hiring a team that understands the local consumer base, you know, whatever it might be, but we're still othering that. Now we're othering the entire office. You know what I mean? And that happens a lot too. And I say this kind of funny because I work for a, a company headquartered in Geneva and we've had this interesting thing that's happened is we opened the SF office. SF is its own trip, right? We have our own like very hustle, startup hustle and entrepreneur and all of that. Yeah. And Geneva is very, you know, it's very European, it's very buttoned up. And it's been so exciting to explore that dynamic and see how we can be symbiotic with each other. But it's funny to think about how many people, uh, how the reverse could also work. And the fact we don't think about that all that often. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that. So what, according to you, is the best way to wield empathy and data to build an inclusive team? Well, I think empathy is a core value. And yeah. so it's definitely one of our values uh, in, our, in our SF offices, we call it people first. So it, we, and we, we actually have weekly uh, at our all hands meeting, we actually do like a shout out where we say, okay, for this value, like who has, who's embodied this particular value? We have other values as well, but who has embodied people first as a value, you know, this week. And so people get celebrated for some of the emotional labor that goes into managing a team or being a good peer, you know, uh, that is not acknowledged. And we make a point of basically rewarding people and way, not literally rewarding them, but kind of celebrating uh, empathy and just compassion for, for people. And during this pandemic time, I think that's taken the form of, you know, people just checking in on each other or, uh, or, or entertaining someone's child by reading them a story while someone else was on a really critical call. Or we've had team members step up in this way, and we just think wow. it's important to acknowledge some of those creative connections that people are forming, you know, uh, and not just with their friends, with people like, that just needed, needed a hand. So, um, so that's a way I think you can kind of really uh, celebrate empathy and not just kind of say, okay, everyone be empathetic and, you know, here's some like things you can say, you know, <laughs> okay, well, like, <laughs> there's this hilarious article that had like this, it was like a collection of things that had come out from leadership about like things you can say to be empathetic. And I'm like, that's actually to appear empathetic. Like that's not being empathetic. Like, those are very different things, right? Like better than nothing, but really not great. So, so how do we, how do we kind of celebrate that in our culture? And then when it comes to data, you know, I do think, um, someone put in the chat here, you know, I do think that retention is a good proxy for inclusion, you know, like if you're sticking around, uh, particularly if you're a high performer, if you're choosing to stay around, there's something about that that's working. So I think before people walk out the door and, and, and doing an exit interview, it's about checking in with your high performers and saying, you know, what is it that is, that is making you happy at this job? We don't do that. We don't ask that question in part because we don't want to like suddenly indicate like, oh, you know, but it's about kind of incorporating those people at every level into the culture and saying, we want to do better. We want to replicate the experience that you're having. Is yeah. it your manager? Is it your, your responsibilities? Is it the opportunity you perceive? Is it your work-life balance? Like what are the things that, that keep you feeling rewarded here? Um, you know, beyond compensation, which in many cases is not, you know, necessarily the thing that's keeping people in place um, and understanding that and seeing if there's a way to replicate replicate that or to train, you know, manager or whatever it might be that more of the company to embody those characteristics. You bring up a very good point and mostly uh, how we operate is we focus on the uh, negatives, right? So when somebody is leaving or when somebody is not happy, that's the time, like you said about the exit interview, that's the time when we try to start digging into the whys and the hows and, and they're gone. They're out the door. It's too late. And yeah. people are happy we just take that performance for granted and we're like oh he's doing a good job she's doing a good job let's give them more work to do you know it's exactly like it's the price of success you know one thing they tell you as a parent is you know you you emphasize good behavior yes right? your options are you can try to punish bad behavior it doesn't work if you emphasize and reward good behavior so we're not good at that you know, we do it maybe through bonuses, but then we make it so transactional, you know, and what we don't do is go out to speak to these people and say, tell us, like, you're happy. How can we make that experience happen for other people? We want to, and we're not going to burden you with that responsibility, right? We're not going to say, take on the emotional labor of mentoring 10 people. We're going to say, what is it, right, about your experience that is valuable to you? And frankly, sometimes that conversational, I do it with my team, that conversation sometimes, you know, can trigger things. They can say, well, I'm happy now, but I can see, you know, that six months from now, it's not going to, I'm going to need, you know, more challenge or more whatever, right? And you can get ahead of it. You can get ahead of anything that might uh, 
Cal is one of your very high performers to, to become, to chafe at the, you know, at the level that they're at or whatever it might be, or just even checking in about their career aspirations and how you as a manager can help them grow towards that, even if that means that eventually they leave the nest and go out in the world, you know, to become a contributor from the outside. True. And yeah, I mean, it's like the secret recipe, right? We all want to be uh, the ultimate goal of life. What is that? The ultimate goal of life is to be happy, right? We are all doing everything that we are doing every yeah. day is to be happy. And so if we, fee, if we know happy people, we want to go up to them and say, hey, you know, how are you so calm? How are you so calm? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give us the secret recipe. So <laughs> we ask our happy employees, successful and engaged employees, this before they, you know, they decided to leave the company. So I, I think that's a brilliant strategy and one yeah. that we must all follow. And you know, what's interesting that I hadn't even thought about till right now is we should actually be collecting data on that. Yes. Our happy employees, right? Yes. Like, where are we seeing some star performers and what are the characteristics of those star performers within our company? So we understand here are the characteristics that really ensure or, or you know, lead a path to a path of success at our company. And what does that reflect about our culture? And that data, I think, can be very helpful to us for being honest, because not every company is a fit for every person. And that's not, it, it should not be that we have to bend ourselves or contort to fit every model. But we do need to be very honest. And when it comes to hiring, if we can say, you know, we can say where we, where I, in my office, these are our core values. Like we value these things. And so this is an office that values these things. And I ask people, is that a fit for you? Like, tell me, what is your reaction to hearing our core values? Like, what is your, is it, is it that you're kind of nervous or you're like, oh yeah, that really works for me. Like, how do you feel about that? And people can kind of get a sense of what they're walking into, which I think is really, really uh, important. Oh, yeah, we, we, I have so many more questions, Sheila. I think our time is really <laughs> short. This is awesome. But we do have some uh, questions from our attendees. So I would like to take some of them. One is retention can be a good proxy for inclusion or work satisfaction. And you agree with that, right? I do. Yes. Yeah. And then how your team, Sudha asked this, so for first question was from Vivek and second is, uh, it was more of a comment from Vivek and then Sudha is asking how your team practices empathy is so remarkable. Yeah, she's commenting on empathy is a leading indicator to a diverse environment. Do you think we should collect data to how empathetic office environments are? That is really interesting. And I, I wonder what you would, how you would assess that. It would be a subjective indicator where you would basically, maybe you could actually say, you know, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, very interesting. I think that you're right. It is a leading indicator to a diverse environment, an environment that celebrates distinction rather than others, you know, people who are maybe a minority of a, a demographic in a particular work environment. Um, you could ask things like, you know, uh, how many times over the past month has a colleague reached out to you, you know, uh, personally? Uh, you could ask things like, uh, you know, um, what are indicators of, how many of the following indicators of support have you, have you witnessed in your, in the last quarter? And you could kind of have you know, your manager checked in about your career aspirations. You, you uh, had a social event with peers, you, whatever, da, 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 you know, other, and you can kind of have people kind of fill it in. Um, I think that that could be, it could be quite powerful. I think that what would be interesting would be to say, uh, you know, this is going to vary manager by manager and style by style. And so I think what's, what, what I would not want to see is some sort of uh, monolithic mechanism for demonstrating empathy. You know, I think that there are different ways of being an empathetic person uh, that are going to be comfortable for a particular person. But I think that the notion of being empathetic and having that as a core value is critically important and the ways that manifests might vary. And I, I definitely think that training on how to show an appropriate level of empathy uh, in the workplace is something that I think is really important because I think people sometimes worry about asking too many personal questions and is that going to be awkward you know, is that is that an HR violation you know is it going to get me in trouble is it you know is that kind of thing um so some some training on that I think would be very helpful as a general matter and that could be data that could lead to I think some of the data collection and that could be uh, unique to every company right how much of that allowance into the personal lives what, what do you think about that yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I am a person who, I mean, you can probably tell, I, you know, I, I bring, I'm just myself, kind of whatever environment I'm in, it doesn't really change. And, and some of that is that I feel that, you know, I'm in a position of, of privilege, right? So I can do that. I can be, you know, myself uh, at work. And I try to make very clear when I, you know, that people know what they're getting. Like, I'm a very candid person, and that's just who I am, right? So uh, I think that, but again, I think at earlier points in my career, I was always that way, but it was not something that went over as well, <laughs> very clear you know 
so, so I think that in my mind, I think being that way gets people more comfortable opening up to you. If you show vulnerability, people feel comfortable being vulnerable, you know, and that's something I think I, I, I try to embody. Um, but not everyone feels comfortable being vulnerable. And I, I don't think that should be, a, I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that it's a personality thing. People are, you know, very private and that's, that's their entitlement to be that way. So I think we have to, again, meet people to some extent where they are and say there are different ways of showing vulnerability. You know, I, I heard a story I love about a CEO who took a call and it, you know, it, it didn't go so well and there's a lot of tension happening and his CMO had to come and basically unwind a tangled relationship and kind of save it. And he sat down on a call with the entire team and said, what could I have done differently there? You know, I, I didn't handle that so well. Like, how could I, that's vulnerability. It's not personal. It's not about like my kids or my spouse or whatever, but it's saying like, I, I know that I didn't made a mistake. Yeah. Made a mistake. And it's not just owning the mistake, but I think is a critical hallmark of a good leader. It's saying you all have insight that I need that can help me do better. So how can you help me? And that is a very vulnerable position for someone like a CEO to take. And I think it opens up a conversation on how that vulnerability can translate in a very, it's still a very professional environment, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. We have another audience question from Tori and he says, I had a frank conversation with the Fortune 10 company's director of leadership recruiting. They said that the information is there and even represented, but sometimes not acted up in a meaningful way. How can data scientists and corporate consultants better showcase this information to persuade those leaders to make the necessary changes? Yeah, it's a, it, so much of this is really company politics, right? Yeah. So you can, I, I, see, I see a lot of companies that go out and get these you know, certifications, but the way they're structured, again, it doesn't reveal the true patterns that are being formed. And we know that we can get this data. That's not the issue. We know we can get the data. We know how to deal with the small numbers problems. We know how to do this. And there isn't a desire or a pull request, if you will, from leadership. And even if there is, then the data kind of gets, you know, put into a warehouse, then it's locked away and there's no action. Or worse, the data is published and there's still no action. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, we all know there's a problem. We're not going to be like, whatever, you know, that's bad. You know, you're asking a really tough question because it's so specific to every leader and every company. I think that, I think that Silicon Valley, and I'll speak to the Valley because it's where I've been for the past 15 years, you know, I think that the Valley, uh, it's this whole move fast and break things thing, you know, like why do CEOs go and hire their, you know, business school classmates or their college classmates or their, you know, roommate's girlfriend or why, right? It's because they want to have that, that mind meld where they can kind of like, reach other's minds and to move very, very, very quickly. And I understand that impulse. I mean, you are accountable to show product quickly, to get a POC out there and a pilot, your VC is reading down your neck, you know, this kind of thing, right? It, it's, but it's deeply, hugely, hugely problematic. And so part of what this is, is opening up those networks and saying, you know, it, 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 part of this is on the part of funders to get into a whole different conversation to say, you know, it's not okay because over, over the long term, yes, you may be able to move quickly, but you're building for a very narrow demographic that looks like you. And that's just what's going to happen because your unconscious bias is going to come. Being an inclusive leader in a time of crisis or in a time of stress is one of the hardest things for anyone to do. It is so hard to do because your tendency is to go to what you know and to move fast and to make decisions without complete data because you feel like you have to move and you're just, you feel like you're, this is happening. I'm seeing this happening all over the world in this pandemic. People are freaking out. They're just feeling like, it. and so taking a moment to pause and really think about uh, what would an inclusive response to this situation look like is hard. It's hard. It's hard to step out of the immediate fight or flight adrenaline and do that. But it's easier if you have a diverse leadership team. So I'm not really answering the question because it is, it is an ongoing issue. How do you convince a leader that is not inclined to see it this way, that this stuff is important? I think it has to come from pressure from the external environment. I think you're not gonna convince that leader with data from their, their own company, honestly. I think it has to almost be like there's a shaming because all their peers are doing it. And if they're the one not doing it, it, it looks really, really bad. And over time, you have to embed the practice. Whether or not they embrace it is, is less important, honestly. I mean, that's what you ideally would want, but you can't always change the mindset. It's more important that it's done. Yeah. Cynical answer, but you know, unfortunately, that's, that's what I believe. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. So I think we, do, we are out of time, Sheila. This has been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Yeah, me too, for me too. 
I want to leave with this final quote, and I'm sure you'll agree. A slightly modified quote from Andres Tapia, senior client partner at Con Ferry. Uh, Diversity is the mix. Inclusion is making the mix work. And my addition is, and data is the magic ingredient in making that happen. 100% 100% agree. And Shilpi, I'm just, thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled about this next four days. Congratulations. And thank you to everyone. And I know there were many conversations, many things in the chat. So I look forward to, you know, chatting on Twitter uh, about this uh, going forward. But thank you so much. Thank you, Sheila. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.